to start my conversation with you because, yes, because you did highlight something that I found very interesting about your career. Jade is the person who brought Ndani TV to life. And I think we can agree that when she did that, it, it changed the way a lot of us saw how we consume media, so to speak. You know, moving so much content into the digital space. So where do you see media on the continent with regards to the... Because what you literally did was change the way we approach filmmaking. Where do you see filmmaking in relation to the digital space? And are there any applications that people in, so to speak, mainstream media can take from that? So I think, um, just like around the world, what digital will do for us is um, help democratize the process. So it means that anybody, I mean, I was talking to a filmmaker earlier today, and a number of us as filmmakers in Africa and Nigeria, our dream is to make projects that can travel all around the world, right? And Typically for some people that means going to festivals and all of these things, but if you don't have the contacts or the resources for all of that, what the internet does for you is it opens you up. So if you have great content and you put it onto the internet, it means that potentially anybody from anywhere around the world can see your content. So all you need to do is focus on making great work and it can travel through the internet. So that was why, um, I mean for us at, at the time, the online space was so interesting. I mean, it, it wasn't even, as you say, at the time it, it hadn't, blown up the way it has now. So it felt very fresh and very new and it changed sort of the way people were consuming content. But I think going forward, it's more exciting for young filmmakers who don't have, you can use your iPhone and then your friends who are also talented just like you are and you guys can come together and create something really special and put it out into the world and hopefully um, get an audience but also get opportunities, you know, otherwise you might not be able to get. Very true, very true. Um, sir, I'm gonna head over to you. Um, in a lot of your interviews, you seem to get questions about why you weren't addressing things like xenophobia and so on. And you made a very valid point, which was that, yes, these things exist, but there's so many other conversations that we can also have. Do you find um, that as a female filmmaker or a woman in the filmmaking space, you, um, the expectation is that you automatically have to make films for women? And if that is the expectation, do you feel it's valid or should we just open up the space? Um, so the, the first couple of films I made were actually coming of age stories about young boys. Um, Otello Burning, right? Yeah, Otello Burning. And yeah. I did a, a feature documentary called Surfing Soweto about these young boys who train surf. Um, again, just to interrupt, Otello Burning has been announced, it was announced one of the most important films of the decade, right? Mm. By, by CNN. <laughs> so please, can we have... They're, they're also modest here, you know. <laughs> These are all incredible women doing revolutionary things, really. Go on. Um, so I, I guess for me as a filmmaker, I make films about things that I'm interested in. Um, and... You know, uh, being, being a white filmmaker in South Africa, um, race is a big issue and it's, it's a huge question. I, I often get asked, you know, what entitles you to make stories about young black boys surfing? Or what entitles you to, I mean, the, the film I've currently made is an Indian gangster film <laughs> based in Joburg. You know, what entitles me as a white woman to make an Indian gangster film um, based in Joburg? And I make films because I think I have something to say about those topics. It's not that the experience is mine, but I think I have something to add to the conversation. Um, so, you know, I, I made a film called Layanda, which was a coming of age story about a young girl. And I made that film because I wanted to make a film about the young girl and about the I hope it speaks to more people, but I made it because I had something to say to her. Um, so, no, I, I mean, gosh, I don't really think I'm answering your question. <laughs> but no, I, 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 I don't feel I need to make films for women, and I definitely don't feel I only need to make films for last women. But I feel like all the films I made, I, I, I make, 
are made from a female perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. I mean, it's really important to me because I, I think it's a perspective that's really needed uh, in cinema. And a, pers a perspective that, that helps make the world in many ways less violent. Mm -hmm. um, so, then what we've seen happen with you over the last couple of years is um, it seems like all of a sudden people are aware mm -hmm. that you are a filmmaker. You know, it's, it's very funny how, how that has happened, but all of a sudden it seems that people are noticing <laughs> that. And we're also seeing alongside that a lot of the work you're doing features very strong female um, characters. Um, how much of that is life following you, so to speak? Or is it just you at a point, are you the person saying, all right, these are the kind of films I want to make? Or do you feel that because you're becoming identified as a, a, a strong woman in the industry, then of course it makes sense that we should call Tokwe? Because it's, it's just following on from, from Sarah's perspective. Um, I think with everything in life, we need to get to that point where we find our heart. I think that's probably what happened. Um, because I started directing for about, about 10 years ago, but I started on TV. So most of the work Sorry, I did... Sorry, just that interruption. She's 50. <laughs> 50. Uh -huh. No, not her age. The movie, 50. <laughs> that was stupid. <laughs> I tried that. 50 is um, the largest grossing movie. Yeah, at the time. Uh, yeah, it was the largest grossing movie of its time. Yeah. And it was revolutionary in how it showed the lives of um, middle-aged, which I, I hate that term, <laughs> you know, but um, what's a good word? Grown women in Nigeria. <laughs> Mature women. Mature women, yeah. Yeah, so I was, as I was saying, um, so most of the work I did earlier on in my career as a director were... Um, works that I was paid to do, not so much what I cared about. I directed Tinsel for about five years, um, but there were things that I did for the money or things you know, that I just did because I needed to work, I needed to creative expression. But um, as I grew in my career, I decided to find my heart and things that I cared about. Um, because first and foremost, before being a director, I've always been an artist. As a young girl, I always painted, I drew, I danced. I mean, I did all of these things with my sister. So, I mean, this is what we did in our idle time all the time. We were either drawing or designing dresses or see everything that had to do with the arts. So finding myself as a director was, you know, not um, an accident. So as the years grew on and I decided what are the things that I care about? What are the things I want to talk about? Um, I've always wanted to see myself as changing the world. Why am I here? Why am I an artist? What does my work say? How does my work affect whoever watches it? Does it change something within them? I want to be able to be at the point where anybody in the world can watch my film and not just go away with the entertainment value, but be changed from beginning to the end of a movie, you must have had an experience that touches you in your personal life, that changes your orientation, that changes the way you think. Um, this became my goal as the years wore on, and I found that I started connecting more with people, and you know, people would want to connect with me or talk to me or share with me life-changing stories of how they wanted to commit suicide, and then they watched the Reti and it you know, turned their lives around, and several testimonies like that. So I feel like generally for the artist or even for the human being, you need to locate the heart, your passion, why you're here, what you're really here to do, you know, what my message is to the world. You know, then you have started to exist. Then you have started to find your purpose, why you're here, and whatever. Um, um, discipline you find yourself in. So I think this is what has happened that you described. So let's talk about money. Mm. Yes. Um, you, you've mentioned that Isoken took you about three years to, to bring to life. And one of those, um, one of the things that took, made it take that period was sourcing the, the budgets, so to speak. Um, a lot of women coming into the, the filmmaking space, as democratic as it's becoming, often struggle with issues like finance. Can you share some perspectives from your journey that, that could help other people? Yeah, I mean, I think men and women actually struggle with that, especially in our industry where... Um, there is a lot of data, so it's not as though you just research online and, and put together like protection. 
And the people who have the data are not as willing to share their data, right? Um, one of the things that you were mentioning earlier with Swift, for instance, there are not a lot of people in the industry that are willing to take on a new first-time filmmaker and say, okay, I think you have talent, this is the way to go, and you know, don't make this mistake, make that mistake. So for instance, for me, um, it's okay was a very elaborate lesson in filmmaking, in film, um, in particular in Nigeria, in film distribution, in film marketing, all of these things. And as a Nigerian filmmaker, you tend to take on all these roles. So you're, you're a producer, you're the director, you're the writer, you're the you're promoter, you're the distributor, you're all sorts of things for yourself. Um, so yeah, it did take me two years at first to raise the money to shoot the film another year to raise the money to do post-production as well as marketing for the film. So in all, um, I, I, I wrote the script, the first draft of the script in 2014. It didn't come to cinemas until 2017, uh, you know, ju June, I think. Um, however, things are changing. That's what's interesting. I mean, so the industry is not nowhere near where it was three years ago, or even 10 years ago. So there are more um, avenues where you can find money, raise money for your film. It's just... Um, having the right sort of data to back up what you're pitching to people, um, have, knowing where to go for the kind of money you're looking for as well, because there are all sorts of sources of, of money as well. I got, I raised my money predominantly, about 70% of the production funds came from the Bank of Industry, and it was a loan. Um, and they, they're financing a number of projects right now as well at the Bank of Industry, so they're a good source of revenue, I would, I would, sorry, um, investment, I would say, or debt because that was essentially what it was. It was debt, it was an investment. And then uh, the rest of the money came from um, friends and family, my own savings I had been saving up for quite a while. Um, and then money from marketing came from sponsorship predominantly, I would say. So yeah, that, that's essentially how, how I raised the money for the film. You know, one of the things I'm realizing in, in, your, in your sharing is how important it is to understand the business oh, yeah. of filmmaking. And I think, especially for the creatives here, we want, we, I mean, we have an idea, we put it together, but there's so many other factors, you know, that we need to consider. And sometimes there's a struggle with that. Um, this is going to lead me to, we'll, we'll talk about SWIFT, but I'd just like you to contrast the, your experience as a, as a filmmaker in South Africa, where financing is. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I've been in the last little while while I've been here, I've been talking to a bunch of Nigerian filmmakers about financing, and the thing that struck me so clearly is the difference between South Africa and Nigeria in terms of, of film financing, is that we have a huge amount of government support. Um, for film in terms of funding. So, you know, we have a rebate system where at least 25 to 35% of your budget is given back to you um, if you spend the money in South Africa on South Africans' um, products or services or whatever. So the access to money is a lot easier in South Africa, but I think the, the, the flip side of that is that our market is really small. You know, I mean, South Africa is a... a country with 11 official languages. So if you make a film in one of those 11 languages and you divide that 50 million people by, by 11, you know, you land up with a very small potential market, most of whom are not cinema-going people. So I think the, the, even the most successful South African films don't make money in South Africa. Um, whereas I think films really do have the potential to make money in Nigeria. So, you know, for example, you, you, you're talking about the bank, uh, a bank giving you a loan. No bank in South Africa would ever give you a loan for a film because their experience is they'll never get that money back. Um, and that's the reality. So, yeah, in terms of, of financing our films, they're, they're easier to get grants and to get soft money. But, yeah, chances, you know, you better make sure that within that you're getting a salary because the making money on the other side is really is really challenging. Such an interesting contrast. So can we still say, in Nigeria at least, that it's still a male-dominated industry? Because there is that perception that the Nigerian film industry is male-dominated. Is that still true? And if yes, in, in what areas? Um, I still want to believe um, and describe it as a male-dominated industry. But at the same time, what I'd, I think I would actually say is that Nigerian women are becoming stronger. And um, we're getting up and doing it either, you know, we're not waiting to be given a permission to 
direct or to produce, you know. People are just getting up and saying, I want to produce a film, I'm going to produce a film, I want to direct it, I'm going to direct it. Even if, you know, you, you, you haven't been to any film school or whatever, they're just getting up and doing things and then they learn their lesson, okay, I didn't make a great movie, I'll make it better next time. You know, so this is what we've seen over the past few years, but the past two, three years, we've had all sorts of females getting up and saying, we are just going to do it, which is sort of the revolution that we're now seeing, you know, just like we also talked about earlier, about three years ago, I made this documentary about female directors, you know, in a male-dominated um, industry. After that, we've had the BBC documentary on female directors in Hollywood. We've had, um, there was something else last week, yeah, a book launch about the female directors, and, you know? So now it, it's like, okay, this is happening. People are talking about it. We have to recognize it, you know? So I think it's more a celebration of the strength of the Nigerian woman now, of not sitting down, not waiting for doors to be open for them. They're saying, I want to do this, and I'm going to do it. However I do it, I'm going to do it and keep doing it until I get it right. Fantastic. Sarah, could you just give us um, a little bit of information about SWIFT? And um, it's, it's a pretty important, it's a big deal. Um, when you hear about it, I think you'll agree. Okay, well now you put it that way, it can't possibly sound like a, like, like a big deal. But so, um, you know, I, I, I think everybody knows about these Harvey Weinstein allegations. And I think... Um, what, what they've done in South Africa is definitely bring to the forefront what's been a huge problem in, in the industry in South Africa. So about a year and a half ago, a group of women who work in the industry, across the industry, so not just directors or, and writers and producers, but camera women and actresses and people who work in wardrobe, I mean literally across the board in the industry, came together and formed an organization called SWIFT, which is Sisters Working in Film and Television. Um, and the idea was, I mean, the original idea was to, to get more women involved in the industry, to get better representation of women on screen, and to get better representation of women behind the screen. But I think what we found very quickly, and this was, you know, this was a year and a half ago, this was long before Harvey Weinstein, was that in actual fact, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to just talk about the industry in South Africa because that's, that's what I know. But the industry wasn't safe for women. You know, we did, we did this quite wide-ranging survey and the results were horrifying. I think almost 70% of the women who we surveyed didn't feel safe going to work in the industry, um, which is terrifying. I mean, it, you know, it's, th this is... This is women going to work every day in a place that they don't feel physically safe. And this is abuse, and this is, you know, the dangers of shooting at night time. I mean, it's, you know, all those, those things combine. But what became very quickly apparent to us at SWIFT was that it's all very well to try and get more women into the industry and try and get better representation of women, but you can't do that until you can protect, protect the women who are in the industry. And I think... You know, because it's an industry that's so freelance, because it's an industry that's got so, that, that so much is about appearance and about the way you look, it's an industry that really is, is a place where women are so much more vulnerable. Um, and so as SWIFT, we've started a whole lot of different initiatives to try and make the industry safer for women, as well as to create a network of women who work together and support each other in a similar way to the way in which sort of like an old boys club works. So that it's women assisting and helping each other um, and bringing other women into the industry in that same sort of way. And I mean, what we found has been, it's been really, it's been such an exciting initiative. I think we agree that it's, it's a pretty important thing, right? It sounds like something that we should bring you know, and I know that um, with the um, female, the, the women in filmmaking in Nigeria seem, they seem to be a pretty tight um, community. Now, I have a lot of questions left, but I did promise that we were going to open it up. So if you have a question, could you indicate and... Um Each year we have filmmakers doing this at this, film, at this book festival. Who you make films in Hollywood? I don't see books being adapted in film. So why is that? Yes, there might not be a lot, but we've actually adapted some books. Maybe not as much as you would like. 
Thank you. So there are examples within the audience. So we are making maybe what you want us to do is to make more, which I agree, you know, that we need to make more adaptations. But then again, I think we're doing a little bit, but we can do more, yes. And I think also the question is, if, if you're looking at what your audience, because th there are trends in, in the industry. I mean, how many people went to watch 93 Days? Let's be honest. And when you put that beside some of the other films that were commercial successes, there wasn't a negate, one did not negate the other. But it seems that we're still looking for films as escapism, as opposed to reflections on the more serious themes. Even when we're talking about serious things, there, there has to be comedy, you know? Yeah. So maybe we're also, the, the industry is also a reflection of, of the audience, I, I, I think, right? So we're just gonna have um, just one last thought from, from you all. Um, it could be what you feel about the industry, what you would like to see in the industry, or perhaps what you think you would have loved to hear when you were starting out, whatever it is you would like to say, just to round up. I would, um, I would have said to myself, be patient, um, focus on the work, and the work being the material, so your story, right? It all starts with the story, and if you don't have a strong enough point of view, a strong enough story, I would say go back and go back. Don't be impatient. Don't, don't be so lost in the light, because for, if you're the director or the producer of a project, Trust me, the life <laughs> is the, like the, the tiniest bit of your work, to be honest. It's focus on the story first, Sto focus on um, your point of view, and then try to network as much as possible because there's a lot of knowledge out there. You won't meet, everybody won't be friendly, everybody won't be upfront with the information, but you will meet people who are willing to share their knowledge with you. And if you don't tap into that, what will happen is you'll make a lot of expensive mistakes unnecessary and expensive mistakes. So first of all, make sure you have the right, first of all, make sure you have the right story and then network with people who have what you don't have, the, the exposure, the experience, the networks that you don't, and then try to leverage off of that. That's what I would say. So, um, you know, w when I think about being a director, I, I think about being the driver of a big ship and the most important thing for me is to make sure that the people around you are great. You know, everyone gets to say, oh, you're the director or whatever, but actually if a film is great, it's because you as the director drove everybody on that ship in the same direction, you know, so that you, you communicated your vision clearly enough to everybody, but also that you had an amazing team of people around you. So I, I would say that the most important thing really is to choose the people that you work with so carefully. Because, um, you know, it, it's such a funny thing. I've traveled to so many festivals around the world and when you hear, oh God, will all the men just close their ears for a second? <laughs> when, when you hear men talking about their films as directors, they'll always stand up there and they'll go, I did this and my film and when you hear women talking about films, they'll always say, we did this and our film. And I think it's such an important difference. Um, but I think it's, yeah, I, I, I think that no, no director can be great by herself. You know, it's, it's the actors and it's the writer and it's the camera person and it's all those people being inspired by the director and buying into the director and understanding the director's vision. It's not everybody making their own little project. That doesn't work either. But yeah, so for me, if I was going to talk to a new director, I would say it's important to understand that directing is about driving that ship and communicating your vision. Because it's not you that does the vision. You know, it's not you that stands up and is the actress. It's not you that is the, the camera person or that does the light. You have to make sure those people are doing yeah, what you want. Um, for me, I just like to speak generally um, to everybody, male, female, young and old. Um, that there's it's just always more you can be. That's a lesson in my life. And um, 
it's a flame that I want to keep passing on to everyone that every given point in time in life wherever you are there's always so much more you can be like a hundredfold of where you are at that particular point in time so always aspire to do more and when you ever you get to a point where you feel now I know this this is great it's time to push harder in another direction or a step higher um, at wherever you are there is never any zenith in life there is there is nowhere in life where you've gotten and that's the end. So you, you have to keep reaching, you have to keep pushing, you have to keep finding new challenges in life. And I think basically that's what life is all about because the day when you get to that point where you say, I'm all in on a life, I've accomplished everything, then might as well be time to die. So let's keep achieving. And that brings us to the end of um, our conversation. I, was it good? I'm glad to hear that.